but we trust you brought your Bibles with you. If you have them, would you turn with me into the book of Joshua chapter 3 uh, for the ministry of his word this morning? Amen. Isn't this a wonderful time of year, an exciting time of the year, the beginning of a new year, a new set of 12 months that we have before us? And, uh, you know, I mean, the, the day physically doesn't change from the days that we had last year, physically, but it can represent a, a new beginning for all of us. Amen. Joshua chapter 3, and uh, we'll read three verses, starting from verse number 3. And they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which you must go. For you have not passed this way heretofore. We, we haven't been to 2011 before the 1st of January. 2011. I remember as a kid in the 80s, you know, they would make movies about 2000 and something, you know, Space Odyssey, I can't even remember. Not, space 1999. But now we are in a new decade. And I know there's some young people here who have uh, perhaps never seen a round dial telephone and uh, never known life without a washing machine and dishwasher. Uh, but it, it's amazing how we have come to this point in history. And here he tells the children of Israel, you haven't come this way before. And Joshua in verse 5 said unto the people, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. He says, get yourself ready, because there's coming a day that's going to be different from the day before. Amen. We are... Entering into a new decade. Well, some say we've already entered into it, 2010. Others may argue that it's not a new decade until there's a one uh, at the end of that year. But we are entering into a new decade. And I want to talk to you this morning about what to take into the new decade. What to take into the new decade. Let's pray for the ministry of his word and let's ask the Lord to bless us this morning. Father, we thank you for your presence that we feel the Spirit of God, Lord Jesus, that is at work in all of us, Lord God, that uh, we can sense in our own spirits, Lord God, as you move in us and touch us. We pray once again that you would speak to us through your word, through the ministry of your word. Anoint your servant that I may bring to them the bread of life and speak to our hearts and give us understanding in our minds. And we thank you for this time. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. It can well and truly be argued that we are now officially into the new decade of the tens or the teens. Uh, sociologists are once again confronted with a challenge to be able to give a name to this new decade. We often define our history in terms of decades. Uh, we talk about the swinging 60s and the roaring 20s. And in the last, uh, the 20th century previously, it was very simple to just name them by their numbers, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. But between 2000 and 2009, it was a little less clear what to call it. The most popular one, perhaps, was either the noughts, because there's three zeros it began with, the noughties or noughts, the 2000s, or what I liked the most was the OOs, the two O's in between, because that's kind of how uh, we can define those last 10 years. There was a uh-oh period. Turn to your neighbor and say, uh-oh. Here we go. The OOs not only describe the two zeros that are in between that number of the year of our Lord, but it was also descriptive of the major events that affected the world in a huge way. Of course, the beginning of 2000s or the OOs was uh, no more, could no more be remembered 
by that, that notorious date of September 11, 2001. It ushered in a new period in our history, a new era uh, that was called terrorism, uh, that all of a sudden paranoia began to uh, saturate our world and our atmosphere. And then it began to conclude at the beginning of two, uh, 2007 by the global financial crisis, which to this date, we still are feeling the effects of it throughout the world. And it is defined this last decade with those major events that have significantly affect, uh, affected our world. And so now we are in what may be called the teenies. They're beginning to call it the teenies. 2010 onwards to 2009 are the teens. Uh, and, and this is especially significant for us because not only are we at the precipice or the beginning of a new year, but today we are at the beginning of a new decade. Not only can we look at society in terms of the last 10 years, but we can also look back not only on the last 12 months, but also on the last 10 years and see how far we've come. Uh, it's often so easy to overestimate our accomplishments over the last 12 months, but we often underestimate our accomplishments over the last 10 years. Uh, you know, the last 10 years for us, if you just simply look back uh, from 2011 to 2001, we can see the many significant changes for all of us individually. There are some who've gotten married over the last 10 years. Uh, some have, you know, had a few kids, uh, gained a few kilos. Don't say amen too loud to that. <laughs> Some have lost speed. You know, I've realized I've lost pace. You know, I can't run as fast anymore. Or when I do run, I feel it longer the next two days. Uh, we've gained a different perspective. You know, to me, I tell some of the young people, my 20s were like a blur. It, it just, just went. I, I really don't, can't remember what I did in my 20s. It just seemed like a blur. It just had all of these issues I've been grappling with and not that I don't have anymore. Uh, but the last 10 years have just gone so far and so fast. And uh, for some, it's been a tough 10 years. It's been difficult and it's been uh, hazard with challenges of all kinds. And when you look back over this last decade of your life, perhaps there is a running theme that has been somewhat prevalent all throughout in your life. And while we understand that this new decade will yet be defined until it has completely run its course, what is exciting is that we have the ability today in our hands to be able to define what the next 10 years will be. And should the Lord tarry till 2020, and we have a vision for 2020, our 2020 vision is 2,020 members by within 10 years' time. And we ought to have a vision, and we ought to be able to restake our claim that no matter what, I'm sticking with the Lord. I'm not saying that you can predict every little thing that's going to happen to you in the last 10 years. But from here on, from this beginning of this decade, you can make a determination in your life that no matter what comes your way, that you're going to stick with God that you're going to be committed to the cause of Jesus Christ. I've come to simply remind us today that we are at this time, the beginning of the year, no better time in our lives than to be able to look down the road of 2020. And we can't predict what's going to happen to us, but we can make a commitment right now that no matter what it is, I will define my next 10 years. My last 10 years was difficult. The last 10 years of my life was still tough going, but I've got a determined heart. I made up my mind that no matter what it takes, I'm going to hold on to Jesus that the next 10 years would be for the glory of God. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm in this for the long haul. Amen. I know I'm going to be, I'll be 47 in 10 years time. I'm going to be, oh, I'm actually 38 this year. I, I'm, I'm being very open with you this morning. I won't even put my year on my Facebook, you know, what year I was born. But I want you to understand that uh, there is coming a time uh, 
that this 10 years doesn't only represent a new set of 10 years but it also represents the very fact that it's quite a very possible that in the next 10 years the Lord will come back for his church that we are this year a year closer to the return and the coming of the Lord Jesus and Jesus reminds the church he says it in his word he said comfort one another with these words that he's going to come like a thief in the night that he's going to come in an hour when you don't expect and the world is saying no he ain't coming I ain't seen nobody I ain't seen nobody coming from the sky but come to declare uh, let this preacher speak into your words this morning that regardless of what you like about me or don't like but if you can hear these words he's coming back he's coming back he's coming back not because I said so but because the word of God declares that he's coming for a bride he's coming for a church that is without spot or blemish amen I pray that we don't get so caught up with our church programs. I pray that we don't get so busy with what we're doing. And yes, some of those things are business for God. I pray we don't get so preoccupied with our lives, with the things that are involved, that somehow we forget that at any moment, that at any day, any hour of the day, he could come back. You've got to have this sense, and I want to encourage you today, that this sense that at the, any moment the Lord will return. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. And we stand well into this new millennium and this new decade that's poised for rapture. We've had a, a tough several years in the, even in the history of this church. We've had a tough last few years. And we count the great things that God has done. Of course, God has done some incredible things in the midst of that through the church. And let me remind you today, that no matter what the church suffers, and this is what Brother Woodward preached, regardless of what we have gone through, it doesn't matter the persecution and the trouble. We are troubled on every side and yet not perplexed. He said we are cast down, but we are not destroyed. Let me remind you today, church, it doesn't matter what era that we're living in, but the fact that we are here today ought to speak to your heart to remind you that God has his church in the palm of his hand. And no man no devil in this world can pluck us out but the church still stands today the church is alive because it's his church and I want you to know that the church of the living God will enter this new decade we will enter into this new millennium with the power of almighty God Amen. I read a book review recently talking about how, how science and rationalism and psychology is the modern religion and how men have rejected God in this postmodern world and have chosen rather than to, to choose their own way and their own thinking. And this book reviewer, as he was reviewing this book, said, he criticized the author and said, this author has forgotten the most incredible phenomenon of the, of the century. He said the greatest phenomenon of the century is the rise of the Pentecostal movement where people are hungry for the things of the spirit he said he's forgotten that the greatest movement and the biggest growing church in this world is a Pentecostal church and I want to simply declare here we are that we stand in the precipice of history here are the Pentecostals the Pentecostals are alive and we are here to stay <laughs> hallelujah hallelujah Amen. Pentecostalism is cool nowadays, but I want you to know this church was around even before Pentecostalism was cool. Even before they were singing our songs and clapping their hands in church and dancing and jumping up and down. Amen. This church was here. It was delivered unto us through the ministry of those that gave their lives. And because the Pentecostalism may be popular today, I want you to know that more than ever before, the apostolic church needs to stand up in this new decade. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so here we are, like the children of Israel. They were poised to take this new territory. They wandered the wilderness as nomads for 40 years, but now they were ready to march to obtain their promise. This was a most significant crossing just, I believe, as significant as the crossing of the Red Sea. But now they were crossing the, the River Jordan. 
It was significant because it also symbolized the changing of the guard from Moses to Joshua. It meant the change from wandering the wilderness to entering into the promised land. They went from a mentality of defense to now an attitude of offense. From wandering to now proclaiming. It was a new era in their history. And as they looked across the Jordan River, they, were, they saw all of the enemies that stood waiting for them. The enemies that were not afraid of this ragtag bunch of nomads. Amen. They were not afraid of these Israelites with all of their fenced cities and double walls. The Bible says there were giants in the land. Amen. They were not afraid of this implacable foes because, amen, they were there for a long, long time. Amen. And there was a reason to be afraid from the Israelite camp. They had every reason to fear. Amen. But God's word came to them and said, the land is yours, but you're going to have to conquer them. The cities are yours, but you're going to have to fight. The vineyards are yours, but you're going to have to possess them all of these things are there before you but you're going to have to get some attitude you're going to get have to get some guts and some courage in your heart and take and fight for what you must possess I want you to know that you're going to have to do all of these things but Joshua said don't worry there's something that's going before you he said the ark of the covenant will go before the people he said all you got to do is keep your eyes on the ark if your eyes are on the ark, amen, you're going to be okay. I want you to know that there is a 10 years ahead of us, a city that is filled with unbelief and idolatry and all kinds of spirits. But I want you to know we're not going in our own strength. We're not traveling in our own might or abilities. But this church will keep its eye upon the Lord Jesus Christ. For the ark will go before us. The ark of the covenant is a symbol and statement indeed of the power of God. It was more than just a good luck charm. It was more than just the remnants of yesterday. It was more than just one man's vision for his world. Uh, the, the box, the Ark of the Covenant, it was instructed by God to Moses of how to create it. It was created with cheap wood, overlaid with gold, and it would have uh, the mercy seat on the top as the lid with the uh, cherubims uh, looking, two cherubims looking at each other with their angels tipped together, touching. Uh, it was uh, the Ark of the Covenant was to possess, it was to be the representation of the Spirit of God in the midst of His people. And I see it today that it represents the presence of God. And there are some things that were delivered to us, amen, when a missionary by the name of Glenn Bogue uh, came to these shores began to preach the gospel that there is only one God, began to preach the salvation message that the only way to be saved is to repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, began to preach the message of the word of God that without holiness no man shall see the Lord. And it was passed on from Glenn Bogue to a man by the name of John Bryan. And from John Bryan it went on to a man uh, by the name of Edward J. Slack, our bishop today. And I want you to know that this same presence of God that has been passed down that is still preaching the same message is not going to change as we cross over into this new decade of time but we will preach the same message we will preach the same truth it's still the same gospel you want to know why because the word never changes the word is still the same he said not one jot or tittle shall be done until every law of the word of God is fulfilled I want you to know that there is a way that you can be saved there is the way that you can make yourself right with God and that message was preached in the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 it is to repent of your sins and then it is to be baptized what for for the remission or the removal of your sins and that's the only way you can get rid of your sins is if you are repenting and are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and then the Bible says you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost I want you to know it's the same message that was preached by the Apostle Peter. It is still the same message of this hour. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. 
Glory to God, it's still the same word. I know our methods will change. We're going to fix up this building in this year. We're going to do some great things. Or we're going to put some new programs and do some of these things. But understand, amen, it's the ark of the covenant. It's the word of God. It is the presence of God that will usher us into the new decade. God forbid that whoever pastors this church would ever preach another message. The indictment of Paul was so strong. Listen to these words. He said, lest we, me, the apostle Paul, or even an angel preach any other gospel unto you. He said, let him be accursed. And I want you to know that God is restoring the apostolic ministry in this new decade is going to come to the fore. We've been in the shadows for too long, but I've determined in my heart after the conference, Brother Jacob, as we declare the sound of the Jubilee, I've declared in my heart that we've got to reach the city of five million people, not with our fancy program, not with all of our great stuff, but with the truth of the word of God, with the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Five million people beckons the apostolic church to get this message out in the world, in the streets. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. That's why I spoke to the pastors, Sister Gina and I spoke to some of the pastors of the church in Sydney, out in Parramatta and Emerton and in, over in, in Cromer. And we said, we've got to get together. We've got to sit down and begin to strategize of how we can reach Sydney. Amen. We're the country down under. They're having revival in Asia. They're having revival in Africa. Even in the United States, they're having revival. And what are we doing in this little corner of the world? I said, we've got to do something. We've got to arrange it so that we can reach the city of five million people. I know not all of them are going to be saved, but I know one thing. If we can get out there, if we can fill the city with our doctrine, somehow God would be drawn to them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Stelling a young man in the church at the conference wanting to know what shall I do been drawn away, made some offers to, to preach another church, but they said they're going to give me a house. They're going to do this for me. But the only thing they ask is that I don't preach this doctrine. And I said, well, I said, well, it seems, it seems to me that your answer is pretty clear. I said, I would not be bought to compromise this message. You see, you got to understand the devil is not stupid. And if the devil is true, and the Bible says he is, and the devil is cunning, and the Bible says he is, the devil's not going to stand in front of the church with his red pajamas and pitchfork to scare the life out of us. But he's far smarter than that. What he will do is begin to twist the doctrine. That's why time and again, the apostle Paul writes, he says, don't let anyone seduce you. He said, I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy lest the devil with his subtlety entice you away from loving the truth from serving God he says if any man loves not the truth the love of the father is not in him and I want you to understand he will attack the truth of the word of God I want you to know that the revival that's going to come in this world is not more of the charismatic movement it's not more of that but it is a revival of the truth of God's word it is a re recovery it is a goal Going back to the apostolic truth of his word. Some say, well, I would rather listen to Jesus than to listen to the apostle Peter. I would rather listen to Jesus than listen to apostle. Do you really think that they contradicted each other? There is no contradiction. But when you begin to look and study systematically... There is a, it's like a jigsaw that when you begin to look into the word of God, your eyes are open. 
and your life is changed. Your life is revolutionized. I tell you, God gave me the Holy Ghost when I was 19 years old. And when they sat me down and opened the Bible, all of a sudden my eyes began to open. I said, oh my goodness. I was brought up in this other church all of my life, never knowing that the Word of never knowing that the Word of God was real. But when they opened up the Word of God, I'm telling you, it gave more sustenance to my soul than marijuana did. It gave more sustenance and excitement than alcohol did in my life. Understand today the word of God. He said, keep your eye on the ark as you cross. And you got to understand inside this box, this, this wooden box that is overlaid with gold, there were things inside of it that God commanded Moses to put in there. So God told Moses, he says, put the uh, tablets of stone, the tablets of the testimony. The word of God often refers to the box, the Ark of the Covenant, as the Ark of the Testimony. In fact, God used that so much that the building that housed the Ark was known as the Tabernacle of the Testimony. And they were not the original tablets of stone that contained the Ten Commandments that God had written with his own finger. Because remember the story of Moses when he came down to, from the mount, he saw the people were all partying. They built a, a, a calf, a golden calf. He took that stone and he broke it. But God commanded Moses to hew out another set of stones and write in it himself what God would say. And so if I can make an application with that this morning, I believe the tablets of stone of testimony it speaks not only of the testimony of God. you got to understand this test, what it means, the testimony. That we should never become a traditional church. That we should never become just a formal church. That, that God forbid that we should just revert back to just routine and ritual. And I know that we meet at the same time every Sunday. And, and we have certain routines of, of schedules and times. But God forbid that when we gather together that the church is merely a religion. That it is merely following rote and routine and ritual. God forbid that we should rely on tradition. But understand that the building blocks of the church is an individual testimony. It is made up of individual souls who have their experience with God. The building blocks of the church, brothers and sisters, are individuals who have had this experience with God. And I want you to understand this morning that you and I have a testimony that our experience with the Lord, amen, this is what God is wanting, is not to lose when we walk into this new decade. Don't lose your testimony, but continue to seek after him continue to establish your relationship with God because God is knocking on the door of your heart the Bible says we overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony don't let your testimony die but the tablets also refers to as God commanded Moses it refers to God working with man. God did himself, did it himself with the first one, but Moses was commanded to hew out the stone and write the next ten, the, the same ten commandments. And this signifies to me uh, that it is uh, that we can't re we can't forget that we are working in partnership. That we are saved by grace, but we are saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves. Understand what people say, well, I don't have to do anything. You know, I'm saved by grace. I just got to sit there, you know, do my own thing because I don't want to, I, I, I better not work because if I work, I'm not, I'm not using, I'm, I'm violating God's grace. The Bible says we are saved by grace through faith. And James said, without faith, without works, your faith is dead. Faith without works is dead. 
And so, yes, we are saved by grace because you know what? No matter how hard we work, if we work 24 hours of every day of the rest of our lives, every single one of us, it will still not be enough to earn and merit the grace of God. If we gave all of the money, if we gave all of our lives and laid down even our own lives for this gospel, it will not be enough to merit and warrant the salvation of God. But understand this grace is access by faith amen and that's why repentance is works but you've got to repent of your sins in order for you to be saved a baptism some would say is works but that's simply a response to the commandment of God's word because we have to work with God we don't just sit there and do nothing and expect God to plop on our legs on our laps his grace but we must act with God 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I'm coming to a close. Verse number 21, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. He says it's by the foolishness of preaching that God has chosen to save them that believe. And I've heard, I heard over the radio recently, you know, a very uh, prolific voice in Christianity today in the United States. And, and I'm not one to criticize, but, you know, we have to judge what, what they say and the fruits. And he was saying that uh, preaching doesn't save. He says it, it's, it's, it's relationship that saves. And can I beg to differ this morning? It's we need to have a relationship with one another. God called us into relationship with each other. But understand that the preaching of God's word still saves. We might have all the great programs. We might have good instruments and equipment and lights. We might have wonderful music. But I'm sorry to say music doesn't save. Please don't get me wrong. I love music. You know, I buy CDs and I listen to them all the time. I'm a big fan of our worship team here. But can I tell you, worship doesn't save. Good music doesn't save. Great equipment doesn't save. But the Bible says that preaching is what saves the preaching of the word of God. And more than any time other in history, we need to be able to preach the word of God. Well, I don't want to say anything. I might offend somebody, you know. I, I don't want to say anything out of turn because uh, this is the mentality of the world today. You don't say those kind of things. You don't declare any absolutes. You just, you know, you just kind of be nice. Teach them how to make more money. You know, preach to them how to have more friends and influence people, you know. Teach them how they can be successful Christians uh, can I tell you today uh, that we need to preach uh, the word of God uh, because it's the word of God uh, that will save us Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12 the Bible says to work out your salvation work it out your own salvation all right well you shouldn't work you know that's works work out your own salvation with fear and trembling and the next item was Aaron's rod that budded. It was an amazing story. They, they put Aaron's rod. There was a political struggle. There was a power struggle. And, and God told the elders, all the elders, give me, give me your staff. All of their sticks that they use, their walking sticks. Now, this, this is in the Bible. And he said, we will see whom God favors. And so they got Aaron's stick, and they all laid it down. And they, they woke up the next day, and they picked up Aaron's rod. They had Aaron's name on it. Picked up Aaron's rod, and Aaron's rod had literally budded. It grew leaves. It didn't just grow leaves. It grew flowers. It didn't just grow flowers. It grew almonds. Almonds. I don't know how you guys say it. Almonds. Almonds? From a stick. It didn't grow no roots. It didn't, he didn't plant it in a, in a flower pot, 
But all of a sudden, it began to bloom with leaves and flowers and nuts. And, and it, it showed, God revealed to them uh, that this is the one, the one that God had had his hand on the very beginning because he wanted them to know. And that's why he said, put the rod of Aaron in the box to remind the children of Israel who exactly is in charge of this thing. Uh, to remind them who is in charge of the kingdom of God. Uh, I want you to know that when we go into this new decade, uh, it ought to be with the Ark of the Covenant leading the way. Uh, and inside the Ark uh, is the fact of the understanding that God is in charge. Uh, that He is the one that has the final say. Uh, he has the final authority. We don't rely on our programs. Uh, we don't rely on the arm of flesh uh, or our talents or abilities. Uh, but we are relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. The Aaron's rod represents the supernatural moving of God's Spirit that He still works miracles. Oh yes, He does. Hallelujah. He still works miracles. I want you to know in this new decade, maybe God never did anything for you last year. Maybe you never saw him in the last 12 months or the last 10 years. But I am determined in this new decade that more than ever before, we need the supernatural moving of God's spirit in this world. We can't do it in our own strength. For Jesus said, it's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit saith the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? Oh, hallelujah. You want to know why? It's not because I said it, but because Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall speak with new tongues. In my name, they shall heal the sick. In my name, they shall cast out devils. In my name. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Nothing great about you and I. We're ordinary. The vessel is earthen, but the treasure is not from the earth. The treasure is not from this world. The treasure is from heaven and the power of God. Stand with me this morning. Hallelujah. We need the supernatural power of God to lead this church into this new decade. This ten, next 10 years that is set before us, there ought to be a strategy in your own individual life that I'm going to make some changes. I'm going to quit the poker machines. I'm going to give up the cigarettes and alcohol. I'm going to give up those things that are just consuming my life. I'm going to turn off the TV. I'm going to turn off all of these movies. I'm going to stop. I'm gonna, the next 10 years, I want it to count. I want it to define. I want to be able to define my world and my community. I want to define my society. And these next 10 years, he said, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do wonders. Today, we've got to sanctify, get ourselves ready because the power of God is going to be made manifest. I'm telling you, God is going to move in this world so powerfully that we won't have enough time to build big buildings. We won't have enough money. We won't have enough time to be able to build big edifices. But this world, this power and spirit will spread from house to house. Will spread just like they did in the book of Acts. It will spread from family to family when we won't have a building enough. And that's why I would to God that every soul in this church today is a potential leader, is a potential preacher, is a potential Bible study teacher, is a potential amen, witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ because God, before he comes he wants to give every soul a chance <laughs> Jesus went to Nazareth if we could have the musicians come and the Bible says there were no, he did not many mighty works in the city of Nazareth where he came from. He didn't do many mighty works. He healed a few sick folk. Why? Because when they saw him, they saw him just simply as a carpenter's son. That familiarity bred, it breeds contempt. And he did no mighty miracles there because they wouldn't let Jesus be Jesus. That's, that's a whole nother sermon. You, you got to learn to let Jesus be Jesus in your life. Too many of us want to be Jesus in our lives. 
And then five miles away, in a city or a town called Capernaum, they had heard about this man called Jesus. They were astonished at his teachings, were, were astounded by his works. The Bible says they brought all of the sick, all of the maim, all of those that were hurt and, and, and halt. And the Bible says he healed them all, every one. Well, you know, God's just going to touch Australia. You know, Australians are too hard. We're too hard people. The Bible says he touched them all, every one. I'm telling you the supernatural power of God can, is dependent. You can say, no, it's not going to happen to me. You're right. The person, the very person next to you can have this attitude to say, Lord, I'm desperate. I'm hungry. I believe not by virtue of how, how good my belief is, but by virtue of your promise. I believe. I'm telling you, you can receive your miracle. Sure, it's just the same old building. It's the same address that we come to every Sunday and Wednesday night. But don't let that familiarity breed a sense of contempt and failure in your own heart. But realize that the Spirit of God is what will lead us. We need a heal them everyone revival. The third thing that was in the Ark of the Covenant, not only was there the tablets of testimony of, or the law, not only was there the, the rod of Aaron that budded, but Moses told Aaron to put the pot of manna in the testimony. He said, put it in the testimony, in, in the Ark of the Covenant. And of course, there is the obvious application of the sustenance of God. This year, if you keep your eyes on the, on the Ark of the Covenant, as He leads you, the presence of God. And the Ark of the Covenant is a beautiful type of Jesus Christ because it is cheap wood overlaid with gold. How can you mix something so cheap with something so precious? And it typifies the Lord Jesus Christ, that God became flesh, something so cheap, something earthly, something so fragile, overlaid with gold by the Spirit of God. He said, if you keep your eye on the covenant, you will march through. And the Bible says when they put their water, in the, their foot in the water, even before the foot landed on the bottom of the water, of the, of the river, the riverbed, just as they dipped their foot, it began to open up. The miraculous. Oh, I, I'm sorry. This... This decade, we're going to trust God for our finances. We're going to trust God for His provision. We're going to trust God to meet the needs for His church. Because we're going to keep our eyes on Jesus. I like what Dr. Harry Aaron's Ironside at Dallas Seminary, their college was about to close. And he prayed. He said, Lord, we know that the cattle on a thousand hills are yours. Can you please sell some of those cattle and send us the money? Well, Dr. Ironside, God did just that. He sent the money. And the college is still open today. I'm telling you, God will provide. I know I've gone a bit too long, but I want to invite you to this altar this morning. If you've never made your peace with God, or perhaps this new decade presents something to you that you've got a vision to God, uh, from God for. I want to invite you to come to this altar and talk to the Lord. Let's make a time of prayer together as a church. If you've never bowed your knee in repentance, I invite you to come out of your seat. Come to this front and we would just love to pray with you. Love to ask God to help you and touch you and, and help you lead, walk in His ways. You need to receive the Holy Spirit. Would you come and seek Him? Our ministers and leaders will come and pray with you. This altar is open this morning. Let's make that commitment again. Lord, what I'm going to take into this new decade is the presence of God, is my relationship with you, my testimony. It is the, the leading of the supernatural. 
and it is your provision that leads us this door this altar is open would you come and seek him say Lord I need you gone on for too long without you been trying to live my own life by myself Lord God and it's still I'm coming up short Lord if I'm weighed in the balances it's most likely that I will be found wanting but this morning I want to receive your grace as I accept it by faith I want to receive your loving kindness and your tender mercies this morning hallelujah I have a determination that this next 10 years I will make count in my life for your kingdom not for myself not to make myself famous or make a name for myself but that for your kingdom it will be fulfilled hallelujah let's pray that this morning there's some needs in this house would you receive that need as God fulfills his promise Begin to ask the Lord to fill your heart. Lord, we need you in this hour. We need a touch from you, Jesus. Dear God, that you would release us, Lord, from heaven. What has got us bound for so long? Set us free, Lord Jesus, from, from thinking that's wrong. Oh, hallelujah.